Castle or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope your week went well. Uh, I've in, kind of enjoyed mine, although it's certainly uh, coming off a of vacation. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that piles up from work, so I've been doing a lot of uh, housekeeping at work and, of course, um, in my general life as well. So, but anyways, glad to have you on board. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, and... Uh, provide a comment five star rating would be most appreciated of course if you always have questions comments thoughts perhaps suggestions for future shows i do hope you reach out to me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com i would love uh to hear from you certainly well, uh, this week, I thought I would talk about something that is important for those of you in the business of wildlife control. And if you are a non-professional and you're just wanting to learn more about wildlife control, I'm going to talk about voles this year. That's voles, not mole. That's V with voles, victory for voles. We want you to get victory over voles. So I thought I would do a little presentation on voles because this is the time of year to be managing voles for the following spring. Yeah, you've heard me correct on that. Typically, people think about voles when the snow melts and then they see how their lawn has been trashed and they say, do something! And the problem is, it's too late. You had to work on your vole problem the previous fall. So those of you in business, now is the time to be talking to your clients about fall vole control and we're going to talk to you about how to do that right now so let me get my uh, powerpoint uh, set up here and get it started so we can talk about dealing with your vole problem so there we are there we with a little bit of voles just going to be a short presentation here so just talk a little bit about identification because we always want to be sure we're dealing with the correct species whenever we're dealing with a wildlife problem last you know as johnny cochran ta taught us we have to avoid the rush to judgment so we want to be sure we're accurately identifying what is causing the problem for your clients so voles tend to be in the genus of microtus there are other genuses out there so but that means small ear and if you look at these particular photographs you can see yep they have very small ears they have ears uh, they're just really hard to see by ears we mean you know the part that sticks out so that's one of the ways you differentiate them from mice because mice have Mickey Mouse ears big ears voles do not voles are really short and they're stocky they're mouse size and you can catch them with a mouse trap but they do not have the slender elegance of a mouse nor do they have the pointy face of a mouse there's they're much more stocky and the reason is, is because they have to try to conserve heat and when you're that small you've got to conserve heat and they burn a lot of energy and hurt because they're active year round so the economically significant voles in the united states tend to be and i'm sure there are others but we're talking about the big ones here right meadow vole prairie vole montane vole long tail vole and then of course the woodland vole that's been sort of cut off by my screen here but the woodland vole you may know that as the pine vole those of you out in those eastern states particularly if you have orchards pine voles are now they're called woodland voles they can cause some devastating but pine voles tend to be much more uh, subterranean in their activity as opposed to some other voles uh, but I'll probably do a presentation on those in the future. So metal voles, we're not going to get into a whole biology thing here. I just want to emphasize the importance of how their ability to reproduce. And that can be explosive, as I've written here. So only three weeks to mature very quickly. Uh, and if, again, five to ten litters a year. And so if they can start that process early in the spring, you can have a lot of voles come fall. Uh, so prairie voles, not quite as explosive as the meadow vole, but certainly very high. So your prairie, uh, meadow vole and your prairie vole are certainly going to be two of your largest species there. Again, montane vole, again, explosive, gestation 21 days, four litters a year, not as much as the meadow 
vol, but it can certainly be devastating. Then, of course, you have your long tail vol and gestation again at 21 days, but they only have two litters per year, right? So significantly lower, but they can be, the damage can be significant in certain habitats to be sure. So what does this mean for you? And that is voles are not going to be a problem every year for your client or for you as a homeowner, but there are tendencies where there are eruptions and we're not exactly sure. I say we, it's not me doing that type of research per se, but I should say the scientists, the biologists who are doing this type of work, we really don't, they really don't know what causes these eruptions. So let me just give you one theory that I think certainly makes a lot of sense. It's not the only theory. I want to be clear about that. But the theory is, is that if you have a, a mild spring with an early green up, and that is the female begins to go into heat sooner. And so with only a gestation period of three weeks, and then it only takes the young three weeks to mature, the sooner that she gets pregnant, the sooner she has young, the sooner that cycle starts. And then of course, if you know anything about exponential growth, that things just start exploding. Excuse me, I've got to make sure I'm pointing the right way because you're seeing things backwards or at least backwards to me. You get that explosive curve like we want our stocks to do, right? Get that explosive curve. So the sooner she starts getting fertile, going into heat, then that's when the whole process starts. So the theory is, is that when you have a warm spring, a wet spring that allows that green up to occur sooner, that is what allows these explosive growth to uh, explosive uh, growth in vol populations to occur. What we call an eruption. Uh, so obviously, not every year spring doesn't come the same time every year, uh, and that's so generally every four to six years. Again, it's not a clockwork; it's just sort of a tendency. There's no law that says it has to be every four to six years, but on average, you get the sort of timing and but that is just one theory as to what causes these eruptions you can do that as you will perhaps you want to just care to keep track how quickly does uh does things green up in your particular area and you know, this is where the calendar i've done a whole presentation before in the previous podcast about the importance of having your own personal calendar for your area wildlife calendar so that you know when things are mating when things are reproducing when the young leave the nest so to speak you should be doing your own naturalist or don't just simply rely on the biologist in your in, at your state capital to do all this for you you need to be getting this data on the ground to make sure that you know what's happening in your particular area Damage identification, again, for, for voles, this is what the picture on the left, as you see, you can see that little trail through the grass. This is what people are worried about when it comes in the spring. The, the snow melts away and they look out in front of their grass and they see that it's trashed. And I can show you a photo there. Of course, for some people, they're going to have plants damaged because the voles are going to be gnawing on the bark. Winter is a very stressful time for voles. They, they don't have the grass and the green vegetation to eat, so they have to go for those barky materials, and they'll try to take off the bark and try to get that cambium layer underneath the bark. And, of course, that kills, that can hinder, or in some cases, if they completely girdle it, can kill, can kill the plant. You can see that in those branches that are dead there. And so voles don't hibernate, of course. They're active under the snow, and then, of course, you see the kind of damage to the turf, and that's what people are worried about. If you have clients who really love their grass, and they want to try to prevent this or reduce it, I don't know if you can guarantee that they won't have this damage in the fall, but you can certainly significantly reduce this sort of damage by controlling in the fall, and I'll show you an illustration of that here shortly. Here's some ex other examples of debarking. Typically, this damage occurs below the snow line. Rabbit damage tends to occur above the snow line, and they'll often you often see the, the, the kicks, the dark kicks droppings. I call them kicks because kicks has those little round balls, and that's very common for what you have for rabbits, for example. But vole damage, again, their teeth is very, they're very small, so we're only looking at about an eighth inch wide. Notice how the grooves go every which way. And then how do we prevent this? Well, habitat modification is important, so you're going to need to tell your clients to be sure they don't allow tall grass. Tall grass encourages vole, vole presence. By tall grass, we mean anything beyond. When the, when the grass grows to a place where it begins to bend over, 
that's when the grass is too tall. So you're looking at about three, four inches, you should be good there. But when you have tall grass like you see here, that's just a vole heaven. They love that because it gives them cover. Of course, if you have debris on the ground, that's also locations where voles can feel safe because they're trying to keep themselves from getting eaten. If your client has bird feeders, they need to be modifying those bird feeders. This is a publication that's available for download. I don't call it free because your tax dollars paid for my salary when I was writing this. Uh, you just don't have to pay for it again. It's one of my pet peeves when you have people that get government funding and they say something is free. It's not free. Stop believing people telling you government stuff is free. Nothing the government does is free. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. Okay. It's just simply not true. What they should say is that this is paid for by your taxes or someone else's taxes and that you don't have to pay for it again. That's what we mean. It's not free, but it's don't have to pay for it again. All right, it's just a pet peeve of mine. I really get irritated when people in government officials or their government funding and they say stuff is free. It's not free. So we're going to talk about toxicants or other ways of controlling voles. That'll be another presentation perhaps down the road. But what I'm talking about here is rodenticides because that's going to be the most efficient, most cost-effective way of managing toxicants. Of course, there's a lot of issues with toxicants. Make sure you are properly licensed because uh, most states, I don't know of a state who does, that doesn't do this, but perhaps maybe there could be, but I doubt it. Typically, states require a commercial applicator's license or a certification to apply rodenticides on someone else's ground, whether it's a general use product or a restricted use product. Certainly, if it's a restricted use product, you're going to have to have a license in order to get it. But make sure you are completely legal in terms of the application. This is why we encourage wildlife control operators get that pest control license as soon as you can. I've done presentations on that process as well. So follow the label, 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 follow that label, make sure you're legal according to state, make sure you have appropriate li liability insurance as well. Now, you your label may require you to look at your endangered species in the area. This is Bulletins Live too. Just do a little Google search or whatever browser you use. EPA Bulletins Live, L-I-V-E, Two T W O, and it will bring you to this web page. And you type in the location where you're going to be applying pesticides. Your label may require you to do this. We're focusing here this presentation in residential areas rather than more agricultural areas. Some of the principles will apply to ag as well, but focusing primarily on residential areas. So you may not have to do this, but read your label. But if you, do, it never hurts to go check out to see if there are any restrictions on rodenticides in your particular area. When you visit this particular page, it'll Google Earth down to your location and will tell you if there are any restrictions on pesticides in this particular area. You print off that document and then attach it to your pesticide label, it becomes part of your pesticide label. Let's talk about bait placement. So typically speaking, when we talk about commensal rodents, now commensal rodents are your house mice, your doorway rat, your roof rat. Typically the rodenticides we're using for commensal rodents are structural based rodenticides. So you have your first generation anticoagulants, your second generation anticoagulants, and then also your non-anticoagulants, right? So you have a lot of variety of options, but they typically require they you to place those bait stations within 100 feet of a structure. So that would be like the person's home. So you may need to have some sort of measuring equipment to make sure that you're not placing your bait stations out. So why do you need to do this? Well, voles don't go into structures, right? If you catch a vole inside of a structure, it's by accident, right? The vole didn't want to be there. The vole damage is occurring in the person's grass. So if you're going to need to put your bait stations out to reduce the population of voles. So come springtime, you're not seeing the type of riddling damage that will often occur over the winter time. So 
you got to make sure you're measuring. So if you read your pesticide label, your rodenticide label, it'll often talk about house mice, roof rat, Norway rat, and you'll often see voles on the label as well. But you can only apply these products typically within 100 feet of a structure. So structures is defined as something permanent, right? It's not just someone's trash can. So you have to look at 100 feet within your house. And if they have a, an outbuilding like a permanent shed or perhaps a garage, you're another 100 feet from that. So you can cover a fair amount of ground in many lawns. It won't be perfect if you go out to that 100 foot level. I'm just trying to illustrate this here on this particular PowerPoint here, but you get the idea. Now, if someone has a vegetable garden, you can't put rodenticides inside of their food garden, but you can put the bait station outside of the food garden, right? This is where the law gets a little a little technical. You say, well, but isn't there the risk of, uh, of a poison vole dying in the garden? Yeah, that, that certainly could happen. So you have to kind of gauge that. But typically speaking, when you get into the fall, the garden is no longer going to be active at this particular time. But you can't put your bait station inside of that garden. So boundaries matter. And you can put your bait station out. But the idea is you want to cover as much grass as possible because you need to be sure your bait stations are available so you can knock that population of voles down in, or as much as possible before the winter winter comes. Now, if you don't want to purchase your bait stations, you can certainly build your own. Your inverted T stations is one option. This is this comes from the University of Idaho. Notice how it uses this inverted T station and it has end caps. It has a two inch wide pipe, but then it has end caps that are cut in half to, to reduce spillage. We want to make sure we're not spilling bait beyond the bait station. Always remember your bait stations must be durable enough to withstand non-target access according to your particular area. So can you buy over the counter ones from manufacturers? Absolutely. But you can also build your own provided they meet the standard. It has to be resistant to six-year-old children. They has to be anchored in a way that they can't pick it up and shake the bait out. And it needs to be designed in a way that doesn't make it easy access for non-target animals. Probably in your area, there's going to be dogs, maybe free-range dogs, or maybe raccoons. In my state, we have bears, so you have to kind of gauge how resistant your station needs to be. You may need to use steel in some cases. But the beauty of this particular inverted T station is that you, they also tell you to put it in underneath a sheet of plywood. And you say, wow, that, why would I want to do that? Well, because voles seek cover. And the plywood sheet not only reduces non-target access to the bait station, because you want the sheet of plywood big enough to extend beyond the arms of the lower arms, the inverted T portion of your bait station, but it also makes it attractive for voles to want to check the area out. Beautiful design, and you just anchor that whole thing down. Plus, it's hard for a six-year-old kid to pick up this heavy piece of, of sheet of... Uh, plywood as well so it's a really ingenious design but the downside is of course if you leave it in place too long it will kill the grass beneath it so you're going to need to make sure you move it around periodically so that is a downside of course you could always you know drill holes in it if you wanted but again that also allows light in which is going to make the voles feel like there's a little less cover but it's something you may need to kind of work out on your own and test it in that particular situation. So as I said before, there are issues with inverted T stations. Notice that here's one that's not anchored properly on the right, but then we also have spillage that you can see there in the picture on the left. You wanna make sure your bait station doesn't have problems with this. Now, most of you are gonna be using block bait, so you can just hang it on a wire, and so as the vole consumes that block bait, another block will just simply slide down the wire down to that inverted T station. 
But if you're using a granular type bait, a pelletized bait, this can be a problem. So you want to make sure you're watching that. And that would be another advantage of having that ply with sheet of plywood over the top, because that would prevent birds from being able to see any of that spilled that spilled grain. So here's the bottom line here, why you've got to get your clients to agree to control voles in the fall so they're not having the damage, that they're not seeing damage in the spring. Notice our chart here. We have vole populations. They start low after the winter ends. Then they begin to peak come October. You can see that in the April, October area. The population spikes. And then after October, and it gets into November, the vole population tends to decrease. Why? Because there's not as much food available for them. So, and they're not mating and they're not reproducing because they're going to be food stressed. And then the winter begins to work on them. That's where you're getting that damage to your grass. Well, what we want to do is we want to knock that population down even sooner so that the population is even lower than what it would be normally. And that's the purpose of controlling in the fall. So come spring, once the snow is gone, the person's waking up to the morning and the snow is gone and they don't see all those lines riddling through their grass. And that's the goal here. But you've got to market it now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late for your client. So hopefully this will give you that sort of end of the year cash push for you or if you're not if you're not in the business of doing this for your own property now is the time to be controlling voles i've talked about poison there's certainly other methods of controlling voles you can use traps as well of course habitat modification those are other presentations so we're keeping it brief and to the point here so if you want to start making some money on voles if you have clients you need this is why you need to keep good records of course so you can follow up with your client because once your clients in the database system you should be looking how i can serve that client for future problems that they may be having and so that you can get that revenue stream for you all right well that's basically it so we, i'm stephen van tassel you've been listening to living the wildlife do take a few moments if you would to subscribe to the channel if you don't like dealing with youtube do visit me over on rumble i do have a my do post there as well just look up wildlife control consultant and you can find my channel over there under rumble in fact i typically post there first in my other uh, in the same podcast as posted on youtube usually at a later date you want to reach out to me would love to hear from you wildlife control consultant at gmail.com i do help people with writing uh, perhaps you have legal issues that you're looking to have man i could be an expert witness for you as well also provide some research and uh photographs and helping you in those in those ways and I'm also looking for photographs, so I'm always looking to purchase use rights of photographs as well. So if I'm always looking for things dealing with wildlife damage of a whole host of species, if you're interested in have making some extra money, reach out to me again at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. So I will even watermark your, your image. So when I, when I use it, and I'll do that as part of my uh, paying you a fee as well, so you know that you have a watermarked image and you can sell it to somebody, sell the use rights to somebody else as well. So I'm not looking for exclusive rights. I'm just looking for copyright permission to use your photo. And so it's a way to generate some revenue for you and, and market your business as well. If you have ideas for the show, definitely reach out. Love to hear from you again. Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. So Bottom line again, control your voles now here in the fall before the snow flies so your client doesn't have vole damage on their turf come spring. And you've been listening to Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, and you've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Well, because it's about to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.